beginning was the word of life. The word came down and shined his light. And I end every man to the will of God. The darkness over came him not. For through him all things came to be. And without him nothing could ever be. We saw him as the only begotten one. Full of grace and truth, the Father said.
Good morning, new life. Good morning, new life. There we go. It's good to be together this morning. Amen. Well, some of you believe it, but we're going to say it anyway. It's good to be here. Uh, you're going to see, um, you know, each week, the worship team is probably going to play as the countdown's going, just to pull everybody in and, and get us ready for the service. How many of you like that one? I like that song. Um, he probably doesn't want me to, but I'm going to say it anyway. Rich actually wrote that one. Uh, so that's an original that you're not going to hear anywhere else. Uh, so if this is your first time, or if they did, they got it from him. Um, but if this is your first time here, welcome. We're honored that you chose to join us here at New Life today. I am Pastor Dustin, the senior pastor here at New Life. Um, so if this is your first time, uh, we would invite you to text the number you see behind me on the screen, 419-573-0440. Just text CONNECT to that number, um, and that allows us to be able to connect with you, get you plugged in uh, to what is going on here at New Life, uh, to find out if there's any way we can be praying for you. Um, and if you do that, um, you can go to the Welcome Center, and one of our greeters will give you just a gift, our way of saying thank you for being here today. A uh, free half gallon of Toff's ice cream. How many of you love you some Toff's ice cream? If you're a visitor and you don't like it, give it to someone else and you have a new best friend because they will thank you for sharing their ice cream with them. Um, if you don't want to text that, you can also, um, there's a, a card in the seat back in front of you. Uh, you can scan the QR code and do it that way. Or if you're like, I don't want to do the technology route, we have paper connect cards back at the Welcome Center. You're free to fill those out as well. Uh, you guys know yesterday was our first backpack uh, drive that we did where people could drive through and pick up some backpacks. Uh, we were pretty happy for the first time doing it. I know we gave away uh, 88 backpacks. Um, so we're, we're happy with that for the first time. I know next year uh, our plans are to start planning ahead, uh, months ahead, and do a, do a, do a big um, event, not just where they're driving through, but have different things uh, going on, different organizations from the community to draw more people out as well. And I know we, there were some people that already said they couldn't make it and they're going to come through, I think, the church tomorrow and pick some more up. So um, by the time we're done, we'll probably give away a little over a hundred backpacks. So those of you who bought a backpack, well, we bought the backpacks, but those of you who bought the supplies and filled those, uh, thank you guys for uh, taking part in that. We were able to uh, pray uh, with, I don't know how many people you prayed with. I know several. Um, and it was cool. We kind of ended it on, on a cool note. There was a, a lady with uh, her two sons that came by and they got ready to, to drive off. Hey, is there any way we can pray with you? The seatbelt comes off. She's like, boys, get out of the car. We never turned down prayer. So we circled up and we had prayer. And I don't know if they got out because they wanted to or because the tone of her voice was like business. It was like, boys, get out of the car. Uh, it's time to pray. Uh, but it was fun. It was fun fellowship and it's always fun to serve people in the community as well. Also, um, next, it's next Saturday, right? Where's Aubrey? Next Saturday, next Saturday. okay, thank you. Uh, next Saturday, there's an event down at Shoreline Park with Project Noel on uh, drug awareness. And I know um, a couple people from our church, as well as I think Faith and Father's Heart are gonna be helping lead the worship for that. So next Saturday at 5.30 down at Shoreline, if you guys wanna come out and be a part of that and show your support, that's a great event to be a part of. Look at your neighbor and say September 17th. We are having, we'll probably do this about once a quarter, have a special fellowship. September 17th after the church service from 12.30 to 2.30, we are gonna have a church potluck. How many of you like some good food? Some potluck, the church. We're gonna provide the hot dogs and it's up to you all um, to bring the, the side dishes for the potluck. So if you just want hot dogs, we'll have you covered. But we hope that you guys will bring some of your favorite dishes, uh, snacks, desserts. If you want to go all out and bring a main dish, that is totally okay, too. Um, but it's fun just to have the fellowship with everybody and get to sit down and talk outside of the church service. It's powerful and it's important and biblical to gather and do what we do each Sunday morning. But it's also biblical and important to sit down and have fellowship and to break bread with one another. So that'll be September 17th from 12.30 to 2.30. With that being said, I wanna issue a little challenge to you all. Uh, most of that is gonna be outside. You know, we'll have some games and stuff set up, but obviously uh, we need, especially in the event of inclement weather, but also if it's hot and people just need to be inside, uh, 
we need to use the fellowship hall as well. That's the last major project, not the only project, but the last major project we have left. So if you all want to have full access to the potluck, guess what that means? It's time to help finish the fellowship hall. All right, so right, the big thing we need, amen, thank you. We pay him to say that, by the way. He's on staff. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. Um, but no, seriously, we want to, you know, this entire relocation has been a blessing. God's hand has been upon it. Uh, but we, we want to wrap things up moving into the fall time. Uh, you know, there's, there's some different events that we're already hosting, trainings in the community. Um, but that really, we can do even more uh, because right now we're having to squeeze them into some smaller spaces. So we need to get that done. Um, that's also intended to be the main area for our youth group as well. And we want them to be able to have full access to what they uh, need as well. So the big thing right now is if you were good at skim coding um, and, and, and prepping stuff, we need people who can do that because we've got to do some of the, the cosmetic stuff and patch stuff up before we can get the paint going. Uh, because once we finish that, uh, John and his team will lay that floor down in no time. So they're, they're waiting on us to get the stuff done so we can finish that up and get in there and be able to finish this and have full access to the building. Access to the building. So if you're able to do that, um, I think it's in your bulletin as well. You can email us, let us know your availability, and we will make sure that you've got the stuff here to be able to do that and get a team together to knock that out. Uh, last announcement is next Sunday, August 27th, is... Uh, this is the second year we've called it this, is Say Yes Sunday. What is Say Yes Sunday? Well, next Sunday, um, what we're doing now, the last uh, Sunday of August every year, kind of the, the wrap-up of summer as we start heading into school and start getting ready for fall time. If you're like me, I love early fall. It's my favorite time of the year. It's still warm, but not blistering hot. But next Sunday, um, we're going to have some tables set up in the lobby with all the different areas uh, and all the different teams that you can be a part of serving here in the church. And over the next, uh, this week and next week, the next couple of weeks, um, I'm going to be talking um, about serving. But what I want you to do, uh, what I want you to realize and how we would approach this week, next week, and Say Yes Sunday next week, is we're not simply asking you just to fill a slot. To say yes is something we're asking you. Ultimately, we're asking you to say yes to God with what he has gifted you to serve within the body of Christ. And I'm gonna get more into that this week, next week. Uh, it's gonna be a powerful time. And we've got some, some more powerful teachings coming up in September that I'll tell you guys more about. If you stand with me, we're gonna open up in prayer today. I'm gonna to pray for the service, pray for the tithes and offerings. If you'd like to give, you can do so online um, or at the box at the back of the sanctuary or out in the lobby, you can do that as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness that we have the freedom to gather together with other people and worship you. We invite you into this place, Father, have your way uh, in our hearts and our lives. Father, we pray for everything that goes on here today from the worship to the message to what the kids are learning in the kids' classes. Father, we ask that you would be glorified, not simply here, but in our everyday lives. Father, we pray for the offering and the tithes that are giving today. I pray that you would bless the hands that give. Help us to give cheerfully. And Father, help us to be good stewards here as a leadership with the, with the money you give us to help accomplish the mission that you have called us to here in the same dusky area. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take two minutes to greet one another, and then the worship team is going to lead us in the worship.
Good morning, church. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, today is a good ha- good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, we were, we was discussing with the team earlier today, this morning, while we were getting ready for rehearsal, and um, as I have been reflecting over Pastor Dustin's message today, you know that 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 context of taking a look in our hand and taking a look at what God has already given us. I know. Uh, one of the hardest things sometimes to process being being a Christian, especially when we when we start looking into the idea of like um, of you know witnessing, right? Being being Christians, being being the salt, being the light. Sometimes we can look inwardly, right? Somewhere down the line, maybe when we were kids, somebody said something to us, or maybe while we were growing up, maybe we had a, a mean boss at a job that we had who said something to you, and you bought into the lie, right? that you don't have what it takes to be a good witness for Christ. That somewhere down the line, you've bought into that lie, right? That you don't have, right? You don't have what it takes to witness to somebody, to bring somebody to Jesus, to tell somebody the goodness and grace of Jesus. And so I just want to encourage you guys today that um, regardless of what lies have been spoken over you, whether even if you spoke them over yourselves, right, to take a look in your hand and realize that God has given every single person in this room exactly what they need to be an effective and efficient minister of the gospel to the lost, to the hurt, to the broken in this world, and you don't let anything ever tell you otherwise. You renounce those lies that you've bought into, renounce those lies that you don't know your scripture enough, you don't pray enough, you don't talk to God enough, you don't read your Bible enough, you can't help nobody. Renounce those lies right now that you are too broken, that your heart's too messed up, that your past is too dark, that you've done too many terrible things. Renounce those lies that have been spoken over your life, that you are not capable of professing the glory and gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost, hurt, and broken of this world. Amen.
takes our mess, right? Turns it into a message. Amen. Again, look in your hand. God has given you everything you already need to be an effective witness for Jesus. Amen. (laughs) Can we get a nine volt battery? Apologize.
love that song, man. Come on, hell lost another one. I am free. Hallelujah. Come on.
Amen. Can we lift our hands together in prayer today? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for that amazing grace. Father, that undeserved favor that you gave us, not because we earned it or could ever deserve it, but Father, because of your love. Because you wanted us to experience the fullness of your love, the fullness of your salvation. Father, we thank you that each and every one of us here today that have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, we can sing that song that we sang a little bit ago, hell lost another one, I am free, because not because of what we did, because of the blood of Jesus that redeemed us, empowered us, gave us victory, and set us free over anything that Satan could ever try to bring against us. I thank you the chains are gone today when we trust in you. There is power in the blood, and that blood will never lose its power. Father, I pray today that you would continue to be with us as we move into the message. Speak through me in a clear and powerful way that it would not simply be my words or my ideas, but your word and your heart being communicated to us here today. If there's anyone here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would draw them to that place today. Father, is anybody here wondering if you see them, wondering if their life has meaning, wonder if they have a place or a purpose. Father, I pray that they would find that in you and you alone today. That you would remind them and prove to them that you see them. You love them and you have a plan and a purpose, a great purpose for their life. I pray you would continue to be glorified here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. Our kids are dismissed at this time. Kids in uh, grades one through six, you can go ahead and meet your teacher in the hallway. Give your kids a hand clap if you appreciate them this morning. All right. So this week and next week, you'll see the title slide up here in just a moment. This week and next week, we're doing, I won't really call it a series because it's only two weeks, but a, a mini series, if you will, titled, What's in Your Hand? Look at your neighbor and say, something is in your hand. You may not be able to see it physically, but it's there. I actually did a message with the same title last year. I don't remember, I think it was an entire series. I don't remember exactly everything we talked about. So the, the title is the same, but the content is not. Uh, there may be some of it that's a little bit similar, but what's in your hand? The truth is, is that God has placed something in each and every person's hand to steward and to use for his purpose. What is that purpose? It's not simply to fill a slot here at New Life Church so we can have all the spots filled. The way I said filled really sounded like West Virginia. My, my <laughs> southern accent came out there. Filled. And yes, that's certainly part of it. And you're going to hear me talking in, in the coming weeks, especially when we get to, to September, as I announced, I think, last week. In September, before evangelist Nick Walker gets here for our revival, um, we're going to do a series titled The Road to 300, What's Next for New Life? be talking about some of the things that God has not just laid on, on my heart, but some of the things we've, we've been talking about with our staff and, and with their board and what we feel God leading us into. And notice I said what's next for new life, not what's the final destination for new life, but what is next for new life. But one of the things we, I've, I've shared with the team is, you know, God doesn't bring growth to someone before they're able to sustain that growth. And so certainly there, there is an importance in, in having things filled and, and positions filled here within the church so we can be prepared for what God is bringing. But what I want you to realize is what happens here in this building is meant to prepare us to go out where we are Monday through Saturday and be the hands and feet of Jesus. So yes, we're asking you, we're going to have stuff for you to say yes to next week. But ultimately, what I want you to do, and as your pastor, I hope you hear my heart this weekend and next week and in the coming weeks with what we're going to be talking about. My heart is that you realize that God has placed a gift in your hand, in your life, to help build his church and his kingdom. Say, so, well, what do I have to offer? More than what you think. Much more than what you think. Because it's not, it's not you doing it on your own power. I can tell you every time I preach, I say, God, I don't want to step foot on that stage if you're not there. Could I give you a motivational speech? Yeah, I could do that. And you may say, hey, good job this morning. But what I say to you does not have the power to transform your life if God's anointing is not on it. 
And we're going to look at people. I'm going to lay the foundation this morning, but then we're going to also look at some real life examples from scripture of people who what was in their hand seemed insignificant either to them, to other people, or maybe to both. But when the presence and the anointing of God hits that, when we surrender the gift that he's given us to him to build his kingdom, he does what only he can do. And my prayer has been, and I've shared this with, with our team, I said, I believe what God is bringing, not just to new life, but the church as a whole will be something that man cannot take credit for. We can take credit for good music, maybe some good programs, but when lives start being radically transformed and changed, you cannot take credit for that. Man cannot do that. I cannot save anybody that walks through the doors. I can present the gospel to them. I can speak the truth to them, but I do not have the power to save them. That is Jesus and Jesus alone. But here's the thing. Everyone here today has something in your hand to say yes with. If you look out on our wall where it says our, our DNA, you'll hear more about uh, some of this in September. Our fourth core value here at New Life is we serve selflessly. We live in a culture today that some people may serve, but if we're honest, sometimes we can serve selfishly instead of selflessly, right? I'll serve if everything is the way I think it should be. Let, let, me, let me let you in on a little secret. All the decisions that get made here that I am responsible for making, I don't make just because it's my preference. There's some things that we do and I'm like, I prefer not to do it that way. But if God tells you to do something, you do it. We don't simply serve if everything is exactly how we think it should be. We serve because God has called us to do it, because he has gifted us to serve. If you're taking notes, write this down and put a star by it. Serving doesn't happen out of convenience, but sacrifice. When you say yes, that means you're saying no to something else. And when you serve, it will cost you something. How many of you have been praying for revival? If you're praying for it, be ready to pay the price. Revival costs something. I'm not trying to talk you out of being excited for the revival coming. I'm just saying, sometimes we pray for things and God says, well, I'll bring it, but you, you got to be willing to be an agent that I want to use to bring it. We don't serve out of convenience, but out of sacrifice. And sacrifice happens out of a heart that is aligned with the heart of God. When your heart is aligned with God, you develop a heart that desires to serve. Over these next two weeks, we're gonna look at things that will encourage you, open our eyes on the depth of God's love and grace for us. Some things will challenge and motivate us, and some things are going to deeply challenge and maybe even convict. You see, that's what the word of God is meant to do. All those things, if you look at 2 Timothy, chapter three, verses 16 through 17, it says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do or to teach us what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. And Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Do you realize this book I hold in my hand is not like any other book known to man? It is alive. It is active. And what, what an honor to be able to gather together every week and hear God's word. And for me, an absolute honor to be able to teach the, 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 the only holy book known to man. Lydia, uh, Lydia and I, my wife, this week were talking and she was just curious. She's like, does it ever get um, like mundane or old? Every week preparing, a, or are, you ever, are you ever like, I've got to do a sermon this week? I was like, no, never. But see, that's when you're using what God has placed in your hand, that's how you know. When you're like, Man, I could do this all the time and it never get old. You're like, you preach from this every week and you always have new material. You could preach from the same verse multiple weeks. There was one pastor that did a seven part series just on John 3, 16, because God's word is so full and it's so rich. God's word is powerful. And here's the thing, laying the foundation that, that, that his word is alive and it's powerful. It encourages, it convicts, it instructs. It's a book unlike any other, but the thing is, this book is final. 
Look at your neighbor and say, it's final whether you like it or not. The world will say, well, let's change what that says. Listen. Next time someone tells you, you can say, listen, homie, you can change the ink on the page, but you can't change what God already breathed into existence. His word is final. I don't think I've ever said homie from the pulpit before. (laughs) I got to move on. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. They're going to bring that up in staff meeting on Tuesday. I can guarantee it. I'm going to walk in and they're going to be like, what's up, homie? <laughs> if no one else will, Rich will. I know he'll do it. Matthew 20, 28. But Jesus called them, being the disciples, called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, the world says you get to be the greatest by seeing how many people you can pass up, how many people you can prove that you're bigger, faster, stronger, get a more prestigious title. That is how you prove that you're great. But Jesus, in talking to his disciples, says... Among you, also meaning you and I, anybody who wants to follow Jesus, it will be different. Now listen, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a prestigious title. I'm not saying it's wrong to be elevated in a position, but you have to understand in the kingdom of God, that's not what makes you great. Jesus says, no, no, no. If you wanna be great, you'll serve. And it says here, but the son of man, here Jesus is the creator, ruler and savior of the world. If anybody had the right to to show up on the earth and be like, hey, I created you, I'm gonna save you, serve me. He had the right, but he didn't do it. I mean, he one, he went to the cross. The night before he's arrested, what's he do to his disciples? He does the task of what was normally done by the, the lowest, poorest person at that location, in that home, and he got down and he washed the feet of the disciples. Have you guys ever, like, I've been in services. I actually did this at one point when I was a youth pastor back in West Virginia. We actually physically, to, to prove the, the humility in this, washed each other's feet. You talk about seeing people get uncomfortable. They're like, I don't want you to see my feet, much less touch them. I don't want to touch your feet. But Jesus set the tone for what he expects from his followers. He said, it will be different among you you will serve. To serve here means to minister or it's referring to actively serve. It literally in the original language means to kick up the dirt because you're actively serving. It's like if you're running in in dirt, what's going to happen? Your movement is going to create dust because you're moving. And so this is the the picture that the original language is, is painting for us. To serve here means to literally kick up the dust because you're on the move. It means caring for the needs of others is the Lord guides in an active, practical way. And here we see Jesus, who conquered death, hell, and the grave, came not to be served, but to serve. And if Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, do you think we have it any other way? The answer is no. See, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are to reflect him. When people look at us, they should see Jesus in us and through us. The word Christian, it was used the first time uh, we see it in Acts 11.26 when it talks about the first place that uh, believers were called Christians. But the word Christian is made up of two words. The first part being Christ means anointed one. And the second part of the verse means little. So the word literally means little anointed ones or little Christ. Meaning again, when people look at us, we should reflect Jesus. It's like this, how many of you here have a child that looks exactly like you? Or when people look at them, they're like, you've got to belong to them. I remember growing up, there were so many times when someone my dad worked with or someone that he went to school with or knew, they would see me maybe in an event or something that everybody was at, and they would go, oh my goodness, you have to be Randy's son. I said, yes, I am. But they said that because when they looked at me, they saw a younger version of my dad. But as followers of Jesus, 
That's what the world should experience. When they look at our lives and the way we live, they should see Jesus. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So here's Peter, and he says, Each of you should not think about using your gift. Each of you should use your gift that you've been given by the grace of God. So I want to I wanna make this reality for us this morning. The gift you have been given to serve within the body of Christ came through the grace of God that came through Jesus dying on the cross for you. Let that sink in for a moment. You have a gift to use within the body of Christ because Jesus paid for it with his life. Jesus didn't just die to save you, but to send you. If you're taking notes, write that one down. He didn't just die to, to save you, but to send you to be a part of a local church body using your gift, to go where you, where you live, in your community, your neighborhood, your school, whatever groups you're a part of. He died to give you a gift. How many of you guys like getting gifts? Amen. You've heard me talk about it. I'm one of those people that's like, hurry up and open your gift. You're taking too long so I can open mine. I like opening gifts. But the gift we have, Jesus paid for. How many of you have wanted to buy someone a gift and you're like, that's a little out of my budget. It's expensive. But maybe you saved up because the person was important enough to spend everything you had. That's what Jesus did. Not just to save you, but to empower you with a gift to help build his kingdom. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You don't have a gift. The same way you can't earn the gift of salvation, you can't earn the gift that you have. Some people assume, well, because I'm still operating in this gift, everything in my life God must approve of. No, you didn't earn your gift. He gave it to you through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Grace is referring to God's undeserved favor, and you've heard me talk about it multiple times. It's, it's painting the picture in the original language. It's referring to someone favorably leaning into somebody to give them what they have. The grace of God was him favorably leaning into our lives through Jesus to give us access to everything that he has. And that gift that is in your hand came through the grace of God that was provided through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That gift isn't simply to hold in your hand, but to release into the hands of God for his use and his glory. We see Paul say in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, he says, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It doesn't say it's wrong to receive. It just says it's actually more blessed to give than to receive. The word bless here in the original language is again made up of a couple different words. But the first part, it means to make long or to make large when God extends his benefits and advantages. It's like the more of God that you experience, you grow. Some of you parents are like, it's like my kid just keeps growing and growing and growing. But think of something if, if you have to extend it in multiple moves to get it to, to be its full length. That's the picture it's painting here. When we're blessed, we grow and we grow as we experience more of God. And it says it's more blessed. The word blessed here is actually, you see the similarities with, with the word grace. As we, as we experience in our lives what God has given to us. The word blessed is also describing a believer that's in, a, in an enviable or fortunate position from receiving God's provisions and favor. So it says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Not saying that you can't be blessed by receiving, because how many of you all have been extremely blessed by other people giving to you? I'll raise my hand. But what it's saying is we actually experience more of God's grace in our lives when we give. You also say it's the same principle with when we serve. I'm not saying that you should not allow yourself to be served, because in the body of Christ, we serve one another as we're ultimately serving God, right? So I told you, I love getting gifts. But scripture says it's more blessed to give and to be a gift. You actually experience more of God's grace by giving than receiving all the time. It's not, it's not wrong to receive. 
but the heart of God is to serve. See, the gifts that, we, that have been placed in our hands to use within the body of Christ and as a part of the body of Christ were made available, as I said, by the grace of God. As we look at Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8, we'll look at this chapter in more detail next week. I'm just going to look at these four or five verses briefly this morning. It talks about the different gifts, some of the different gifts that we've been given. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 4, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the, respons the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. So the first thing I want us to take a moment, and it's easy when we're reading scripture just to read over something really powerful and keep going. This tells us we are the body of Christ. Let that sink in for a moment. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. How does the world see Jesus? Through you and me. Casting Crowns used to have an old song called If We Are the Body. Anybody from my generation remember that one? If we are the body, why aren't his hands going? to show them there is a way. I left out the other ones because I couldn't remember the lyrics. And I didn't want to look weird. I'm trying to remember a song. But he was saying, if we are the body, why isn't the world seeing more of Jesus? So think about how powerful that is. God doesn't just go. Now, he certainly miraculously appears to people. He can certainly do that, and he still does that today. But the predominant way he appears to people around the world is through you and me. Let that sink in for a moment. That's powerful. That he, does, he just doesn't do everything himself. He welcomes us and calls us in to be a part of reaching the world, of pouring into people's lives when they come in off the streets to visit our church. See, we're going to look, as I said, at this more next week. But now that we've established that we all have gifts, we see in Scripture it says you should use those gifts. We all have different gifts. Don't look at someone else and be like, well, they have that gift and I have this gift. God gave you that gift. And it's special. The people who clean the floors in this church are just as important as me giving you the message. Because if the church reeks, because the bathrooms haven't been cleaned in four or five weeks, nobody's going to come into the sanctuary to hear what I have to say. Because the smell's eventually going to work its way in here and nobody wants to experience that. What I'm saying is we all have different gifts. Can you imagine? I mean, think about how your body works. If I drop something, I have to bend over to pick it up. So I have to be able to hinge. My, my core has to make sure I don't fall flat on my face, right? And all these other muscles have to help me be able to stand up. If one of those parts isn't working, guess what? It's going to be harder. You don't think your little toe is important until you don't have one. You don't have it, you're going to realize how important that was. The same way you may be like, well, what, how important can my gift be? More important than you think because it serves a purpose. Let's look at a few examples. Moses. You read in, in the Old Testament, in Exodus, primarily with, with the Israelites being led out of bondage into the promised land. You know, Moses was, was in Israel, born in Egypt when, when the nation of Israel was, was in slavery and in bondage. And at that time, the nation of Israel has started to grow because God's hand of favor was upon them. How many of you know when God's favor is upon something, man can't stop it? The Pharaoh tried to stop it because he was insecure. Insecurity and leadership don't go well. Well, let me rephrase that. He was insecure and power hungry. Those two character traits don't go well in a leader when you're insecure and power hungry. So Pharaoh starts getting nervous because the nation of Israel is growing. And he's like, if they get very big, if they decided to team up with one of our enemies, they'll take us out. So he subjects them to harsh slavery and working conditions. But they continue to grow because God's hand was upon them. So he finally says, okay, when Israelite babies are born, if it's a boy, kill it. If you look throughout history, same thing happened when Jesus was born. 
The king tried to have all the boys two, two years and under in that area killed. Because when a deliverer is born to God's people, Satan tries to take the deliverer out. Why do you, and I'm going to be extremely politically incorrect, but if you go here, you're not surprised. Why do you think today that Satan is trying to, if he can't kill all the babies, he's trying to get the kids so confused that they don't know what or who they are? Do you think that God is getting ready to bring a mighty end time move that is going to liberate and set free like we have never seen before? So if Satan knows it, he's going to try to take out the people that God wants to use to initiate that so they can't be a part of what he wants to do. That's a whole other sermon in and of itself. I actually didn't plan on saying that, but sometimes you just got to go with it. So Moses is born, and the scripture tells us, and I'm going to summarize a lot of these examples for time's sake this morning. But scripture tells us that Moses' parents saw that he was a special baby. And if you research that and look at the original language and, and listen to some of the scholars and theologians, it's likely that in the original language that meant that Moses' parents saw that God had a special plan for his life. See, the thing was, if you knew the prophecies from hundreds of years earlier, if you read in the book of Genesis, it was told to Abraham that your people that are going to descend from you will be slaves in Egypt for 400 years, but I will deliver them. So if you were paying attention to this, people knew, hey, it's been 400 years. Something's got to be coming. So it's very possible, maybe even likely, that Moses' parents realized this baby boy we're looking at is the one that God was talking about when he spoke to Abraham. So they hide him, but you guys know you can only hide a a child for so long as they start crawling everywhere and making more noise and more noise, right? So put yourself in their position. Jochebed, the mother of Moses, decides to put him in a, in a basket and set him out on the riverbed. That'd be hard, right? But she goes off and she's watching in the distance with Moses' older sister and the king or Pharaoh's daughter with her attendants just happened, and this is not a coincidence, just happened to come down and bathe in the Nile and they find Moses. I'm not going to go through all the detail, but long story short, Moses is adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. And I think this is hilarious. The very guy that wanted all the baby boys killed, the one that would deliver, God would use to deliver his people out of his power was actually raised in his house. That is awesome. It's almost God's like, fine, you're going to try to stop what I'm doing. I want to birth it right under your control. And you're not even going to know. But Moses grows and he goes out one day. He had a passion that was placed in his heart for his people by God. And he goes out and he sees an Egyptian beating a fellow Hebrew, an Israelite. And because of his passion, he wanted to do something about it. But I tell people all the time, your greatest strength is always your greatest weakness if it's not harnessed. He had an incredible passion, but it wasn't harnessed at this point. He looks this way, he looks that way, and he sees that nobody's looking, and he kills the Egyptian. That, that's called premeditated murder. He didn't hit him, and it happened by accident. He looked to make sure nobody was looking, and he killed the Egyptian. Had the right heart, took him completely the wrong way. Well, he finds out that people find out, and Pharaoh finds out, so Moses has to, he runs. He's running from his mistake. He's running from everything that God has placed in his hand at that point. And we're going to pick up here in Exodus chapter 3. Because Moses goes, he ends up um, meeting a, a, a shepherd, marrying his daughter. And at this point, we see um, he's tending the, the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, and God meets him. How many of you guys know when you run, God can still come in and meet you when you least expect? Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. So you can put yourself in Moses' shoes. If you're out doing your everyday thing and you look at a bush and it's not burning up, it's going to look weird. And if you go to that bush and you hear a voice, it's going to freak you out. It would me anyway. And God speaks to him. He says, the place you were standing is holy ground. What was special about that ground that made it holy? Was it different than all the other ground that God created differently than didn't create anything else? No, it was holy because God was present. Because God was there. See, when God shows up, it makes wherever he shows up and whoever he shows up in and through different. Your Bibles, most of them... One, it, it one place in the Bible will say Holy Bible. The word Bible comes from the Latin word Biblios. It means book. There's a lot of books. What makes this holy? Because it was breathed by God. Right? You may look at it and it's like, well, there's, there's ink on the page just like there is with any other book. But this is the only book that was fully inspired by God. It's what makes it holy. The word holy means to be set apart. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter tells us, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. What's that next word? A holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Another place in Scripture, we're told God tells the people, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. The word holy means to be set apart. We are set apart because we were different from the world because God, we have set ourselves apart to live for God and God lives within us. Think about that for a moment. The world may look at you and look at someone else and it's like, well, they're exactly the same. But if you've got the breath of God in your life, your life, you are a part of a holy priesthood set apart. We are different, therefore we live. Remember, that's why God said, but you, it will be different. For you will be a servant. You will serve. When you have God's breath in your lungs, it takes what is ordinary and makes it extraordinary. If you look in, in John uh, chapter 20, verse 22, that's when Jesus walked into the room after he had been uh, raised from the dead. The disciples are all hiding out because they're, they're afraid for their lives at this point. He's talking with them. He says, peace be with you. And at one point it says, scripture says that he breathed into them. In that moment, that's when they became born again. That's when they became new, uh, new creatures spiritually. The same way that scripture is God breathed, the life that is within you is God breathed. Therefore, that is what makes you holy and set apart. Nothing that you did on, on your own, nothing you did to earn it. But God tells us to be holy because he has given us his life and our lives should be set apart and look different from the world's. You with me so far? You with me so far? Okay. It's like, well, maybe I didn't communicate it very clearly. God tells Moses, go speak to Pharaoh. Can you imagine what this did to Moses? I'm like, God, I've been like hiding out for years, for decades from that place and you're telling me to go back? Sometimes God tells you to go back into something you've been running from because he's got something he wants to do in you and through you. He says, go back. And Moses, like many of us probably would, at least initially, he starts arguing and starts making excuses. He says, God, who am I to speak to Pharaoh? Who am I to lead your people? God says, I will be with you. And maybe you're here today and at some point in your life, or maybe even today, maybe God's laying something on your heart to get involved, whether it's in the church or maybe do something in your job to, to minister to somebody. And you're saying, God, you got the wrong person. Moses said, he said, but God, who am I? Who am I to lead your people? And God says, I will be with you. But Moses, he keeps arguing. Have you guys ever argued with God? I'll be honest, I have. I still do sometimes. God always wins. Well, I will say, if you finally surrender to God, he always wins. But the, the sad part is, some people refuse to submit and they think they win, but they're actually losing because they're missing out on what God is trying to do in them and through them. But God says, I will be with you. But Moses keeps arguing and we're gonna skip to Exodus chapter four. And this is what happens. It says, but Moses protested again. What if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Do you see what's happening right here? Moses is worried about what other people are going to think. 
What are other people going to think if they see me serving in this position in the church? Who cares? You're not serving them. They don't call you. You're giving your gift to serve God and his mission. But then the Lord asked him, and here's the title for our series, what is that in your hand? He looks at Moses, what's in your hand, Moses? He says, a shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back, I would too. If that thing jumps and in, turns into a snake, I am jumping out of the way. I don't care what you think about me. If I see a snake appear out of nowhere, I'm running. But he throws it down and he jumps back. Then the Lord said, reach out and grab it. So I wonder if God is just having fun with Moses at this point because he didn't believe him. <laughs> Touch the snake. Not really, he wouldn't do that. But. So Moses reached out and grabbed it and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob really has appeared to you. So he asked Moses, what's in your hand? Was there anything special about this piece of wood in Moses' hand? No, not until the presence and the anointing of God was placed upon it. And Moses noticed nothing happened with the staff until Moses released it. You've got to give your gift back to God for him to do what only he can do. Throughout Exodus, we see God do different things as Moses obeyed him with the staff. You guys remember the parting of the Red Sea, right? But again, Moses had to extend his hand and what was in it before God moved. God brought water from the rock. Another place when they were fighting against an enemy, enemy army, as long as the staff was held up into the air, they won. But Moses, he still wasn't convinced. See, God did all these special signs just for Moses to assure him that Moses, I am with you. But Moses still argued. If you go to Exodus 4.10, it says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord. When the word pleaded here, this is like picture your kid down on their hands or down on their knees begging you to say yes. Moses is basically begging God, send somebody else. It says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue tied and my words get tangled. I'm here, Moses, I'm like, well, that's a legitimate excuse. I mean, you're telling me you go speak to the most powerful guy in the world and you're not a good speaker. I can relate to Moses, you hear me, you know, part, part of my miracle is I tell you, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating this, if you're new here and you haven't heard this before, I used to be absolutely mortified to speak in front of people, hated it, didn't want to do it. In school, if I had the option of just submitting a written report and taking a letter grade cut, I'd do it, except I knew my parents would get upset that I took a lower grade when I could have gotten a higher one. But what I'm saying is the very thing that God had placed in my hand to call me into ministry was what Satan was making me believe was inadequate. Let that sink in for a moment. What's the difference when you say, God, this is uncomfortable. I don't know if I can do it, but if you're calling me to do it, I submit it to you. Because you're putting God's opinion of you, his desire for you above what other people may think. Moses says, I'm not very good with words, never have been, not now, even though you have spoken to me. What he's saying is, God, even though you're telling me to do this, I'm not good enough. If we really want to get into it, what Moses is saying is, God, you made a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes, church. What he's saying is, you're calling me to do this, but you haven't made me good enough to do it. God doesn't make mistakes. We keep reading, God said, who made man's mouth? Is it not me? If I made it and I'm telling you to use it, I will be with you. And he said, I will be with you, now go. But if we look in Acts chapter seven, verse 22, we see something different about Moses. And this, in Acts chapter seven, this is when Stephen was speaking to the religious leaders that were getting ready to um, kill him because of his unrelenting faith. And he's talking about Moses. And in Acts 7.22, he says, Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both what? Speech and action. So does scripture contradict itself here? No. Moses, the opinion that Moses had of himself contradicted what was 
true if he would have surrendered to God. See, our opinion of ourselves sometimes contradicts God's opinion of herself. And let me tell you this. When I first say it, you're going to be like, that sounds like heresy. It's not. Let me explain. There comes a time in the situation, in certain situations, where the most important opinion to you isn't God's, but it's yours. God was like, Moses, you're my guy. You can do it. Moses is like, no, I can't. God believes in you. That's why he called you. He's equipped you. One of my favorite phrases that one of my friends always used to tell us was, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. That means he doesn't call you when you've gotten good enough. He makes you good enough when you surrender to him. Big difference. God's opinion of Moses was, hey, you're my guy. You can do it. Moses was like, no, nope, can't do it. So I'm not saying that God's opinion of us, and that, that's what is final. What I'm saying is if our opinion doesn't line up with God's, our opinion will actually keep us from walking in faithful obedience to God and seeing him work in us and through us. See, Moses viewed himself and the gift God has given him as, as inadequate and insufficient. Moses eventually goes on, leads the people into the, well, to the edge of the promised land before Joshua takes over. But what about some other examples? What about David in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17, David and Goliath? David has a sling and a stone in his hand, a slingshot with a smooth stone. And there is this big, huge champion fighter named Goliath. Was it nine and a half feet tall or nine feet, nine inches? Either way, he was a big guy. David's a shepherd with a slingshot. In the natural, David looks like he's crazy. Because if, if you, as you read the passage, the entire Israelite army, including King Saul, who is the biggest and strongest guy in the nation of Israel, when Goliath would come out and insult them and insult God, they all ran and cowered back in fear. But David understood that he was fighting for something greater than just beating a giant. And when he shows up and Goliath comes out and he starts insulting Israel and insulting God, something swelled up inside of David and he had to act. See, God had been preparing him for that moment. But see, what was in David's hand to most of the people in Israel seemed insufficient and inadequate. And it surely did to Goliath. Because if you, if you read the scripture in 1 Samuel 17, when David comes out, Goliath says, am I a dog? Do you come at me with a stick in your hand? He was insulted. But it was that very thing that was in David's hand that God would use to defeat Goliath and bring victory to an entire nation. Goliath is trash talking David. And if I'm David, <coughs> if a guy that's between nine and, feet, nine and 10 feet tall is trash talking me, I'm probably gonna choose my words wisely, right? David gives it right back. He says, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. And what's the purpose of this? He says, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Why do we serve? Why do we use what's in our hands so that others may know God and know that he loves them, sent Jesus to die for them and has a plan and a purpose for their lives to help build his church and his kingdom. It's not to make ourselves look good, now, is it nice when someone comes up and says, hey, I appreciate you serving today? Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not why we do it. We do it, we have to understand, because we're building God's kingdom. And he has given you that gift because he wants you. You're not a bench player on God's team. There are no bench players. God's not gonna be like, mm, you're cut from the team. I don't want you to serve there, sorry. Someone else is better. Everybody has a place on God's team. When, we, when you surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, God has a place for you. How did David defeat Goliath? By taking what was in his hand and using it for the glory of God. What about Noah? What was in Noah's hand? Tools. If I'm not, you know, what do I have to offer the church? I can build things. We could use you. But see, Noah wasn't just building a boat. He was building something that God was going to use to preserve mankind. I saw another church is building a new property, and they said, we're not building a building, we're building an ark to preserve a generation. When you serve, when you help us finish 
the fellowship hall when you help us finish all these other things and whatever God may have us do or build or add in the future, what are you doing? You're not simply building a structure. This is an ark that God wants to use to help preserve generations. People thought Noah was nuts. You're building an ark? A lot of scholars will say at that point that it hadn't really rained before and the, the earth was still watered by you know, the, the water that came up from the earth. So when Noah said, God's gonna send the flood, it's gonna rain. Noah, what are you talking about? But he kept using what was in his hand. He tried to warn people. Scripture tells us that in 2 Peter that Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. But we know from how it turns out, they didn't believe him. I'm going to close this morning, the last example, and I'm actually going to have two or three people just briefly share like a minute each about the power behind what they see God doing in their lives through serving here at New Life and ultimately serving him with their gifts. How many of you guys know the little boy with the lunch in the New Testament? I'm talking about the, the lunch that fed 5,000 men and their families. Love this. And I'm actually going to read this passage. I'm not going to sum, summarize this one. I want us to, to see this one. Mark chapter 6. This, this actually appears in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When it appears in all four Gospels, it's really important. All of scripture is important, but when all four gospels contain it, there's a reason. It says the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what they asked, we'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have, he asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Multitudes, thousands and thousands of people are there to hear the words of Jesus. Can you imagine the disciples, hey Jesus, get them out of here. I mean, that's, that's some audacity. Look at Jesus and say, get these people out. But what they were saying is they're hungry. And I, I can tell you, I've been to the place where this took place in Israel. I was there in 2016 with Pastor John and some other people. And I know some others of you in October are going to be going there. There's still nothing there. Like we took a tour bus and it took us a while to get there, right? And if we were there and it was dinner time, I'd be like, oh, it's going to take, and this is by tour bus. It's going to take a little bit to get to where we can eat. And this is, they were on foot. So I can, I can understand why the disciples are like, hey, you need to send these people away so they can go eat. And Jesus, like he does many times, sometimes we pray for God to do something and he's like, I'm using you. He says, you feed them. They would have to work months to have enough money, even just to give them a little bit. But in John 6, 9, it tells us that there was a little boy there that had lunch, five small barley loaves and two fish. This was what we would call a poor boy's lunch. The five barley loaves, they were very small and it's what a people of, of low income ate. Jesus used something that was viewed as extreme. Are you seeing a pattern in these examples? Moses, oh, I'm insignificant, I'm not enough. Noah, how can tools save a generation? David, the sling and the stone seem like was completely inadequate. The lunch, how in the world can five small loaves from a poor family and two fish feed thousands of people was 5,000 men plus their families. If you, if you study it, scholars will tell you on the low end, 
15,000 people on the high end that could have been as many as 30,000 people. How in the world could that lunch feed those people? Because when you take what is in your hand and say, Jesus, here you go, he does what only he can do with it. So the disciples bring it to him and he breaks it. Sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, if you want to be used before God, you have to allow yourselves to be broken. I don't mean in a negative way. I mean, when we allow our flesh to be broken, that's when God can come in and fill us with his presence and his anointing. See, it seemed insignificant, but when it was placed in the hand of Jesus who broke it, prayed over it, and then released it, the anointing in the hand of God was upon it. Do you realize that Jesus is our, is our intercessor, is praying for you? He prayed for you in scripture. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us according to scripture. See, your gift, what God has placed in your hand may seem insignificant, but you must remember it is given to you by God himself with his blessing upon it. And when you release it from your hand by faith, he multiplies it, empowers it, and uses it for his glory and the transformation of the multitudes. You see, like Goliath looked at the sling and the stone in David's hand, what he couldn't see was the anointing of God upon it. You can't see the anointing, but you can see the effects of it. At this point, if, if the people that are going to uh, briefly share want to go ahead and come on up. I've got Brandy coming up and Steve and Julie. Give them a hand clap for being brave souls this morning. And, and we'll be wrapping up probably in the next five, five, six minutes. But as we were talking about this series, um, I think my wife and some of the other staff as well was like, you know, it, it would be good um, for the congregation to hear from people who are serving. Because y'all expect me to talk about serving and the power of serving, but to hear from other people um, what, how God has grown them, um, what he has shown them as they are serving, it's more powerful than just hearing me say, this is why you should serve. So first, Brandy, and also um, her husband, Austin, but I think he's, he's delegated everything to Brandy this morning uh, to talk, nothing wrong with that. Um, they serve in some different areas, but together they both serve in the kids area. And I think that's why Lydia thought it would be cool to hear from them since as a couple, they are serving back there. So I've asked them to share you know, where they serve, um, what God has really shown them or how he has grown them and why you um, should serve as well. Oh goodness, that's a lot of you out there. <laughs> you do this every week? Um, so I'm back in the children's ministry. I do SOAR um, and I also do IMPACT. You'll see me greeting. Um, I'm also part of the prayer team, so you'll see me from time to time. Um, God has grown me through serving by feeling like I belong. He took me from just coming to church and receiving the message to feeling like I belong. I became a body, the part of the body of the Christ. Or, yeah, body of the Christ. Um, and the reason to serve is, I mean, the gospels say it. And I'm just going to echo what Pastor Dustin said was um, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Um, and then John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. So that is Christ leading by example, showing us how to live and how to serve. No better. Hi, I'm Julie Breaker and I do the parking team. And I worried out all week about what I was going to say because I don't like crowds and I used to take the F in class so I didn't have to stand in front of people and speak. And I like looking unapproachable and, you know, stay away from me. So when I was asked to do the parking, I'm like, it's only going to be one Sunday. I can do one Sunday. Well, it's every other Sunday and it's a commitment and I have to smile and wave and I don't want to smile and wave. I'd rather <laughs> stay away. So I realized, Abba has helped me realize that I do need other people. And I, need, I, I do need to be doing this. And it's helped me get out of myself. And if Jesus can wash feet, I can stand and wave. I can't compete with any of that. But I'm Steve Brager. I help out on the parking detail or whatever you want to call it. You know, 
makes me step out of myself and, and learn to appreciate others and to help out my homies. <laughs> and uh, just appreciate serving as Jesus did. So that's about it. These guys embarrassed me. So <laughs> I'll let it go with that. Thank you, guys. That sums it up right there. If Jesus can wash feet, I can wave, I can wave at people. It's powerful. But I, I, I want to put what they said and what they do in the perspective as we, as we begin to move into altar time. You know, and, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, but before you started serving, would, would you stay in here during meet and greet? Yeah, but you stay in here now, right? There you go. See, when you say yes to God, he takes and he fills in the weak places in your life. But it would be easy to be like, and I'll start with Brandy with the kids, and I'll just go down the line. It's easy to be like, well, it's just teaching lessons to little kids. Do they, do they remember anything? If, if I'm not there, if I, you know, I've had a hard week, I'm just not gonna show up today. It's, I mean, it's just a, it's just a lesson, right? But we don't know, what if that kid is coming? Maybe, maybe their family doesn't come. Maybe they come with a friend, grandparents, whatever. What if all they hear during the week is you're stupid, you're a failure, you're not enough? And, that, and that's what they believe. But then what if they come and hear just a lesson and they hear, you know, there's a God in heaven that loves you, that went to the cross for you. He has a plan for you, he has a purpose for you. That could alter the course of someone's life to change the negative patterns handed down from generation to generation to generation because someone said yes and understood it's more than just a lesson on paper. See, I can take for granted growing up in a Christian home. I never had to wonder if mom and dad were going to be there when I came home. So I can take it for granted. But I've been in ministry for long enough, still not that old, but long enough, I heard enough stories to know that there's kids, if they come here to church, that may be the only time that they actually feel safe. And to see someone that loves them and that welcomes them and cares for them and takes time for them, could actually give them hope. And I see some of you with tears in your eyes because may maybe that was you at one point. And because someone took the time for you, it altered the course of your life. So you're not just filling it. It's, it's not just babysitting. And I'm even speaking, if you're in nursery in here, don't be as well, I'm just holding a kid. Don't just hold that kid. Be praying for them when you're holding them. Even serving in the nursery, it's not just babysitting and changing dirty butts. I'm glad I'm up here and I'm not doing that. I'll say because she's not in here, I knew we had the foster girl that we had for over a year. We, we still babysit her periodically. And right before check-in, I smelled that she was, was uh, dirty. And I'm like, she's getting ready to go to mom in a couple minutes. I got a suit jacket on. I'm just going to let her change it. That was wrong of me, I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> I will apologize later. Or if the nursery worker changed it, God bless you, I should have done it. That's a bad example. But what I'm saying is it's more than just doing the dirty things. You're actually planting eternal seeds. Look at the parking team. See, it's easy to be like, well, all I'm doing is waving at people and saying, right here, or no, not there, over here, whatever it may be. But let me propose it to you this way. What if it's someone that is on the verge of giving up on everything? And they say, God, I will give you one more chance. I will give church one more chance. But if I get rejected again, or if the same thing happens, I will never, I'm, I'm done. And what happens if they go to pull in the parking lot? And I'm just, I'm speaking into the future of what we're praying and believing is coming. What if they pull in and they're like, there's no place to park. They're, they're starting to park people in the grass and the enemy starts, see, you shouldn't have come. You don't belong here. There's not room for you. But what if they see Steve or Julie or, or Seth or Keith and some of his family that help with the parking team? They pull up and they roll their window down and they see that, oh, there's 
fear all over their face. And like, hey, you know what? We got a, we got a parking spot right for you. I'm going to walk you right to. And they walk with the car. And then they get out of the car and they can see that they're still freaked out. And they say, you know what? Parking team, I'm going to be back. I'm going to walk you to the door. And they hand you off to one of the greeters and say, hey, this is so-and-so. I'm glad to have him here today. What does that do? It could take someone from believing a lie of saying, you see, it, God must not want me here because there's not a place for me, to where you've realized you're not just parking people. You play a part in building the kingdom of God and actually snatching that song that we sang, Hell Lost Another One. By saying yes to God was what in, with what is in your hand, I want you to picture actually pulling people out of the hand of Satan, out of the grasp of hell because you say yes. You're not just volunteering. You're not just filling a slot. You are important. You're not inadequate. The gift you have is not inadequate. It's powerful. Not because you made it powerful, but because God breathed on it. So maybe you're here and you're not serving. Can I encourage you, if this is your church home, you need to serve. I'm not just saying that because I want to fill slots. And so our, our, our staff doesn't have to be like, oh, what are we going to do? I'm saying this for your well-being, because without serving, you will not experience the fullness of what God has for you. Because we are called and designed to serve. So yes, it helps us here. But you're also, more than that, you're helping build the kingdom. And you are actually, remember, it's more blessed to give than receive. You will experience a part of God that is only experienced when you serve and give what is in your hand. Is it convenient? Nope. Can I confess, there's some weeks I don't feel like getting up on a Sunday morning. Because the flesh is like, man, you just sleep in? Been a long week, there's a lot going. There's a time when the flesh, when your spirit has to tell the flesh to shut up. There's times I get up like, I, I don't want to do it, whatever. And I have to say, flesh, shut up. You died. You don't get to say in the matter. I'm going to go get what's in my hand anyway. And some of those times are the most, there has been times when I've been given a sermon. You guys don't know when it is because I don't let on. There's been times I'm just like, this feels dead. It's dull. It's hard to finish it and get the altar call because this is just, I bombed it today. Those weeks, someone will come up and Pastor John, you would probably say the same thing as you. He's pastored way longer than I have and he's experienced the same thing. There's times when people come up and it's like, dude, that was powerful. And I've literally gone, what? felt dead. Dude, God spoke to me powerfully. So it's not always, you may be serving in an area and be like, this is doing nothing. You don't know what it's doing in the lives and the hearts of the people that are benefiting from you saying yes. Could you stand with me today? I'm going to give an altar call in general, but before we do that, talking about as children of God being gifted with stuff in our hand. But we are a child of God when we repent of our sin and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Because the truth is, is, each and every one of us, when our life on this earth is done, whether it's we pass away or Jesus comes back, we are all going to stand before a holy and righteous God. And the world will tell you, well, how could a loving God send anybody to hell? He doesn't send anybody. God is a loving God, but he's also a holy righteous and just God, meaning he has to judge sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross, so we could be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. But if we choose to reject that free gift of salvation, when God looks upon us, he doesn't see the blood, he doesn't see righteousness, he sees sin. So when God judges that sin, we experience that judgment. He never intended for mankind to experience that judgment. But if we don't receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, that's exactly what happens. So the truth is, is every single one of us will stand before God at one point and our sins have to be paid for. If you pay for them yourselves, the price is hell. But if you allow Jesus to pay for them, it's paid in full. And instead of hearing, depart from me, I never knew you, you'll hear, welcome, good and faithful servant, I've prepared a place for you. So if you're here today, and you can't say, Pastor, I'm certain that when my life here on earth ends, 
I know where I'm going. My sins are paid for. If you've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, maybe you pray to prayer, as I say sometimes, to get grandma off your back when you were a child, but you never made that commitment. And like, today's the day I need to, I need to say yes to what Jesus did on the cross for me. If you're here and you've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, in just a moment, I want to ask you to raise your hand, not to embarrass you. We do it out in the open here at New Life because scripture says that heaven rejoices when one person repents and comes home. And if you've been here, that's the same thing we do. We yell, we clap, we party, and we rejoice with all of heaven. So if you've never made that decision here today and you want to make your eternity sure today before we move on, I just want you to lift your hand up. I'll wait a couple moments. Anybody today? Okay. We'll look forward to the next time it happens. And that means we got work to do. Every empty seat represents someone that does not know Jesus. And they're likened into today, they would spend eternity separated from him. So as we get ready to, to sing this song, The Goodness of God, I want to ask you today, that throughout this message, hearing the, the purpose and, and the, the power behind saying yes with what God has placed in your hand. Whether you're not serving or you are serving and just want to be even more committed, understanding the power and the importance behind it. Maybe you're serving out of convenience as God is saying, no, I, you can give me a little bit more. What I'm going to ask you is if you're willing to say, God, I give you everything. When it's convenient, when it's not convenient, when it's comfortable, when it's not comfortable, I give you everything. Whatever that means, I give everything. And I say yes with what's in my hand to serve your kingdom. I want you to come and line up as we sing this last song. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. God is always good. He is always faithful to you. And when we say yes, others experience that goodness and faithfulness as well.
as the music keeps playing softly. Father, I pray your blessing and your favor powerfully upon each person. Father, you see all the people here saying, God, whatever you're asking, I give everything. Father, we, we don't just do that for a show, but Father, I pray that each and every person that has made that step to say, I give everything, Father, when they leave here, it will be something that sticks with them. It's not just an act, it's not just a show, but Father, consume them with a passion for your kingdom and your house and the loss. The Father, understand that you placed them here for such a time as this that they have purpose, their life has meaning, their gift and, and their life is not insufficient, inadequate, or not enough. But Father, with you, they have something special in their hand. But Father, as we as individuals and in the church body say yes with what you've placed in your hand, we ask you to do what only you can do. Father, move powerfully in such a way that we cannot take credit for what happens. We pray for revival. And as we talk about doing the work of revival, we will work, but we know that you are the one that has to bring it. We're simply saying yes. Father, I pray that not just here in these four walls of this building, but wherever we go, we'll understand that we don't have a gift for church and then a gift for a secular world. You've given us a gift to impact whether it's people in this building or in our job school, sports teams, whatever it is, you've given us gifts to be able to use so people can know the gospel, know the truth and the redeeming power of the blood of Jesus. We give our lives, we give all that we are, we give, all, we give this church and all that this church is to you and for your glory. In Jesus' name.